Can't hear anybody. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> oh, wow. That happens all the time too, you know, when sometimes it happens even to those of us who have been doing this a while. So it means uh, everything I had talked about, nobody had me. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I try to tell you in the messages, but hey, I know you were busy, man. Right, right, right. Okay, no, that's good. Um, Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining the show uh, this lovely afternoon. I'll just go through my introduction again because apparently I was muted and nobody heard me. So uh, this happens, you know, sometimes we ride with it, that's it. So uh, thank you so much. It's a lovely Sunday. We're excited. We're going to have a spirited conversation. We're going to talk about categories. We're going to talk about race. And we're going to talk about how all of these things uh, feed into the larger context of inequality, which is this series that we want to uh, talk about. And last week, if you remember, we were talking about this theme of inequality, and we focused our conversation around Canada, North America. Uh, and now uh, we are going to be looking at various concepts and how they feed into these themes. So I also have Kaya Pantier and uh, Sylvia Mock. And they are joining us today to talk about uh, community vibes uh, with, with Kaya Pantier. So uh, we're excited for that segment. And I was saying we have Keenan Pratt, uh, who is a regular content contributor to the show. And he's joining us from the capital, Washington, DC. Um, so he will be participating in the conversation as well as giving us some you know, uh, commentary about what's happening in his backyard, some updates. As we know, there is uh, a lot going on uh, down south, our neighbor to the south. So we are happy for everybody who's here. We're happy for all of our viewers who uh, have tuned in to join us. And if you want to participate on the show, as indicated, please leave a comment indicating that we'll make the link available for you to join the conversation. And if you just want to start a watch party, that's also very well appreciated. If you just want to like, and leave us some nice comments. We also appreciate that as well. Um, so thank you, everybody. Kaya, please take it on. Hi, everybody. Um, so as you know, I'm Kaya, and I'm here today in the basement of Rad Store Magada Gym uh, with Sylvia Mock. Uh, Sylvia is a zine coordinator here at Rad Storm. Uh, so I thought she could tell us a little bit about the space, um, maybe just give us a rundown um about like how she came to work here herself and kind of what the space does um so i just before we start i thought i'd give a little rundown of what radstorm is because it's a little hidden um it is on goddard street but um i know that a lot of people um might have missed it on their on their walk over yeah. uh so radstorm is like a collective art space uh they have they offer open hours um for people to come in and use their resources and their tools. They do shared lunches. Um, they do a lot of stuff for the community. They give back a lot. They rely on donations and community help. And so I thought it would be a good you know, topic for us to talk about. Yeah. Um, Good job. Going so smoothly. Um, so me as a person, my name is Sylvia Mock. I'm just a, a high school student. I go to Central High, grade 12. Um, I really like to indulge in the arts and music. So definitely when I heard about Radstorm, I was like, and yeah, I just like to create and, and make friends and and do do lots of things. <laughs> so what is it you do here at Radstone specifically? Oh yeah, so I'm uh, one of the... See, um, this is a place to host a bunch of different... Anchor Archive, 
um, which is just a library of zines. And zines are basically, if you guys don't know what they are, they're completely like self publishing this can have so much different types of content. It could be filled with photographs, it could be filled with poetry, it could have a statement or a message in it. And basically there we just distribute them and sort of like donate their zines for other people to read, but we also sell share and sort of build this community of like artists who want to make zines. So you guys provide kind of like a platform for artists and a place for them to come and get resources. Um, I, yeah, okay. So, I, I would apologize. It seems we're having some network events like Um, Kaya, are you there? Should we pause at the moment? Yes, just pause for a second. It looks like uh, we are having some um, network connections uh, from your end. So. Okay. Yes. All right, continue. Let's, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. Is your Wi-Fi? Okay. Um, so I was just saying that, you know, the space provides a platform for artists. It provides resources to people. Um, I know you guys host, host events. Uh, yeah. So yeah, among them, we have like zine making workshops. So we provide people who don't know anything about, about the space. It's like a chance to sort of make something and to learn something and to indulge in the arts. And we also are um, a music venue. So in the back of the space, um, like bands to perform. And one of the collectives um, is, is Sad Rad, which just provides lots of like artists to find a space to jam out and to perform history punk space so you still see a lot of that in present day it's a bit hardcore but that's like the <laughs> fun of it yeah well you're also um hosting something to support our indigenous uh fishermen we're having a huge drop-off um donation um sort of event that's happening at Radstorm in the first Anything that you might like, warm clothes, just like in like living sort of equipment and stuff like that. And all we do is um, to to the fishermen at Solnyville, and um, we have we have like sort of like every open hours we have like a drop off time, but we're starting to open it to more time. So. Wanting to donate because we'll be doing it more frequently. Yeah. Awesome. And that's like a really good example of the importance of spaces like Radstorm. You know, not only is it like a place for people to, you know, meet other people and indulge themselves in art, like you were saying, um, get access to resources that they might not be able to get access to. It's also like a great space to give back to the community for people who are, you know, want to be engaged in their community actively who want, you know, to use art and music to, you know, talk about politics and social justice issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so is there anything coming up that we can look forward to, you know, in terms of events from that? So I know you were talking about music. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, so yes, there's going to be um, a concert that's happening right next to Radstorm. There's a big open parking lot and there's going to be like a little event there um and yeah so usually well not usually but most often you would find like you know music that's sort of like punk and stuff but you're starting to sort of see like a more like diverse range of artists sort of perform and play so there's been lots of the like, jazz events and and sort of like indie events and the, for this event they're playing like predominantly rap music which i'm really excited about and it's going to happen on october 30th um and other than that there's going to be a um, a 24 hour zine challenge that's happening um, in November, um, which is still, which is still like planned. 
planning, but it's definitely going to happen. And that's just like a challenge where it invites like anyone who's interested in making a scene or learning how to how to like make something or express themselves to, to come over and make something with us. Well, that's wonderful too. Like it's such a diverse group of people. If you ever come into the space, everyone's super friendly and welcoming. I've been, been here a couple times to work on projects. Um, they offer screen printing materials here. Um, you know, just resources for yeah. people to be creative. But it's it's really nice because it brings a lot of people, different people from the community together, different people from different socioeconomic levels, of uh, different interests. Um, and we were talking a lot before about how art is a great medium. People do express themselves emotionally, but also politically yeah. in terms of like social justice. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. yeah, would you want me to like, explore or something okay um yeah especially like for us like I know Kai and I we're like really like best friends and we like we're both really into art and stuff and we definitely have talked about like ways to and use our you know our time to sort of to give back to the community because it's like something that's especially nowadays like everyone's a lot more conscious about what's going on and even within our hometown and I think it's definitely important to think about ways where I, I want to spend more to helping or doing something that's really useful and I think that like a really powerful way to do that is through, through art because mm -hmm. it's not only something that people can keep but also like it could have meaning within it mm -hmm. and definitely um, in the future as a plan to sell art and have all the proceeds go to a certain donation or something that's important or something that we really care about. Well, Radstone really encourages a lot of stuff like that. Um, they really encourage like having a space that's safe for everyone, that's accessible to everyone. They have a number of accessible entrances. Um, they, you know, they encourage a space. They have a policy of reduced harm here. So it's really a safe and open space for everyone which is really nice. And I think what's also interesting is we saw during quarantine, art is a really like becoming an increasing express ourselves politically and socially because we can't together. Yeah. We, we have protests outside, but we can't all get together the same way. We can't discuss things the same way that we, you know, normally would be. And so it's, you know, it's a really valuable tool. Yeah, like art's a way that can reach so many people and without having them be present in the space, I guess, to yeah. allow to like add on to that. And I definitely wanted to add to like, exactly like, I feel like Rastrum is such a huge, like they're well, amazing place, the amazing place to work at and stuff. And so, yeah, I feel like it's a bit of a hidden gem and we're working in open hours, so people that come by and they're like, hmm, I want to check this place out because I've like seen it, but I haven't really gone into it. So it's definitely a, a, a hidden gem of the city, I'd say. Like once you once you're you're in on it, it's it's like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I just you know I really appreciate you coming to talk about it because you're the one who introduced me to this place. Oh so, my gosh! Oh, you know, it's, uh, if you get the chance to check it out, it's uh, a really good you know gateway into getting into the arts community and how. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sylvia and uh, Kaya. That's a really really nice segment there. Uh, uh, sorry to our viewers. Unfortunately, we were having some uh, connection problems, but I'm sure you heard uh, as I did most of what. Uh, Sylvia and Kaya had to talk about. Uh, Radstorm seems like a really nice, huge community resource um, for uh, artists, but as you saw and heard from their conversation, it seems as if uh, Radstorm also does some cross social justice activism, like uh, launching a donation uh, campaign to support the Sipi Nakari uh, First Nations uh, communities down in the South Shore who are experiencing uh, a whole uh, worker uh, issues right now around uh, their moderate livelihood fisheries. So that's something we'll talk a little bit about uh, as we talk about our main themes in the show, but uh, it's great that uh, you mentioned that piece and uh, really shows the importance of Radstorm and, and its reach. So thank you both um, for, for, for coming to uh, present uh, that community uh, resource. 
Well, no worries. Yeah. It's, you know. Thank you so much for having us. This is so, thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like telling me about this. This is really exciting. And I, I I love being a part of that. This is so cool. Well, you're an awesome guy. Ah, yes. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Sylvia, <laughs> um, I, 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 Kaya runs this segment, uh, uh, Community Vibes. So who knows? Uh, we would love to you know, check in sometime later and see what more is happening at Radstorm and what kind of initiatives. Maybe even talk to some of your artists and, and see their work uh, and what are the inspirations behind those works, right? Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a good connection. Yeah, yeah. Hold on me in touch. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Um, we are going to carry on uh, with the next segment of our show. If you uh, want to uh, hang back and watch, good and fine. If you have to go do other things, totally understood. Um, but thank you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Kaya. See you. Bye. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, fellow viewers, that was our community vibes with Kaya Pantier. Uh, they just brought us. Um, some information about a community resource here in Nova Scotia, specifically in Halifax, Radstorm, uh, as you know, and they were telling us about some of the things that uh, are done there. So thank you. Kenan, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's tango, brother. Um, so how, how's, how's the state? How's things going on? You have now uh, how many days is, is it? Uh, it's, uh, I can't even keep up anymore, man. <laughs> I'm looking at my <laughs> calendar right now. Uh, what's the day? The, uh, I, I think it's about uh, 13 days or so. Or, or, or see, maybe, you, you maybe know better than me. Around that area, it. <laughs> right to November 3rd. Uh, so so what's, what's the temperature like? Well, interesting you mentioning the uh, votes because something I was uh, looking at earlier today was the uh the early voting uh registration as far as people going out there to early vote the numbers are like record breaking at this point and you can see it i actually i actually live in northern virginia right on the outskirts of dc but i work Whoa. in dc and i'm from dc so i'm there all the time i was just there this morning seeing my mother helping her do some stuff around the house so being in northern virginia where your vote actually counts because in dc you don't have proper vote representation being that it's not a state and uh, the, and also, if you see me on the show with my firearm, that's because I live in the great state of Virginia. <laughs> in D.C., you can own firearms, but it's a lot of uh, rigmarole to do so. So uh, the point is I'm making with the votes is that there, you can see lines of people right now lined up to vote in ways I've never seen in my life. Right. And I've been paying attention to this landscape for a very long time. So uh, the temperature is people, what I, what I gather from that is that the Early voting and people that are interested in voting is because they care about change in the society that they live in. When people don't vote, they tend to see things seem to seem to be okay. When society is doing well, there's no war, there's no strife. Many people think that oh, I don't have any reason to go out there and really create these change. But as things are getting a little tighter in this current uh, society and the pandemic and everything going on, people care, and you can see it. So that's what I'll say about the landscape right now in comparison to things that I've said to you before is that I really see people really wanting to create change because another thing to add to that is, as a society, we watched two presidents in the 16 year period not win the popular vote. They won the electoral college, which many people in the states and outside don't understand very well. And because of that, it goes to show you that maybe the people don't really have the power and so people are really going to check their power right now. Hmm. Hmm. That is, uh, I must say that that is powerful uh, coming from you because um, uh, we've had several conversations and, and, and I know that sometimes, you know, we, we get frustrated with, you know, is this all just about, you know, this democratic process of voting and issues that should be discussed uh, in depth and perhaps find solutions uh, are always funneled through political voting processes as an expression of what, you know, those issues mean to different people and, and how uh, it should be solved. So I know we've talked a little bit about that on, on, on various occasions, but I think it's good uh, that, you know, nevertheless, uh, we are encouraging people to vote, 
as a way of expressing that they want things to not be the way it is. Whether uh, it is, you know, uh, uh, however that process plays out from when the elections is done, it's a separate question. But I think that's generally a good thing to encourage people to, you know, uh, express through their vote uh, that civic responsibility that they want change or they are dissatisfied with the status quo. I agree. I mean, like I have my differences of opinion when it comes to voting uh, locally versus nationally, and I'll leave that for another time. But what I'll say is that we're all at different levels as far as our awareness to our government. And so when you're 18 and you're legally allowed to vote, you've just now graduated from high school, maybe you're going into college, and therefore you've got a lot to put on your mind and a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. And now you have choice a choice to really have an impact on your society, allegedly. Um, with that being said, many 18 to probably 25-year-old people, a lot of the times have not participated in voting because of them trying to adjust to moving out of their home and growing into their life and getting out of college and getting a career and not really having time to be in the politics. And I've seen and heard many people say that because they're worried about their day-to-day no -day survival. Um, but what, it, what I also want to say when it comes to people voting and, and having different levels of awareness is that I'm, when you say that you were surprised to hear that from me, usually because you may hear more militant stances in my belief or understanding of that we're at a brink of possible civil war. And that's because I've been looking at it from, a, I'm looking at it from a bird's eye view where many people are just working their way up the ladder of understanding. And I'm not saying that to be condescending because there are people who are definitely more intelligent than I am and understand what I don't. Mm -hmm. But I feel that way because comfortably I understand history repeats itself. Many people are just now coming to the point where they realize the system and the democracy does not work for them the way that they thought. Some of these people are in their 20s, which is beautiful. But then there's some of these people, and probably more of them who are in their 60s and 70s, who are just now coming to the realization that we're living in what I call the illusion of inclusion. Mm. Mm. The illusion of inclusion. That is a powerful statement. And I just got to uh, say this. Uh, when I said I was surprised, uh, you absolutely captured why I said that. It, it's not because I think that you have other views around. It's just because I know we always talk uh, looking at the big picture from a bird's eye view, we analyze, you know, what we see, but, you know, we don't necessarily opine on, you know, our personal uh, opinions in terms of an exchange on what the issues are. But um, I want to pick up on what you just said, the illusion of inclusion. You know, today the topic, the theme that we had for today was categories and race and how, or, 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 um, how those feed into the larger narrative around inequality. You know, on the poster, I also asked the question, um, is there an end in sight to inequality, right? Are you familiar with what's going on in South Africa right now? Yes. So there's always a means to end to inequality, but it's not the way that people tend to believe that it will come. Because what I have this discussion with many family members who are starting to come to the same realization is that one of the things I say to them a lot of the times is that if you stole land from an indigenous people with means of murder, of disease, how would you allow those grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren to just vote their way back into power, especially if they have the ability to learn the atrocities that created the society that they live in? You, you're not going to vote your way back into power. People that have power in this world, they take it. And until people are ready to sacrifice what it needs to take your power, we'll continuously just ride around this hamster wheel of what we consider to be freedom. And that's the way I see it because of understanding. And some people don't. They think that, oh, we can create change. It's getting better little by little. We can do things in a society that we couldn't do 50 years ago. Yeah, but understand that sometimes your oppressors will give you room to not realize that you're being oppressed so you won't rebel. Mm. So, so let, let's set the stage for, for, this, for this larger conversation that, that we're gonna have over a number of series. Um, and, and we were already there. Uh, first of all, uh, just like we did, I wanna acknowledge um, the uh, Sipinakedic First Nations uh, communities uh, who are advocating and uh, uh, advocating rightfully so uh, for an opportunity 
uh, and space to express uh, their rights uh, to a moderate uh, fishery livelihood here in Nova Scotia. Uh, there's been a lot of news coverage around this issue. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge that here on Unfiltered, we recognize those, those folks and, and we, uh, uh, we, send, we certainly support uh, uh, their right, their treaty right uh, to, to a lively, uh, to a moderate livelihood. Now, uh, there is a lot I can say, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure um, a lot of other people have said so many things about the way this is played out, the way this has been covered, uh, but I, I want to say this, uh, we here at Unfiltered, we don't condone violence, we don't support violence, we condemn all violence. But we recognize that in advancing or advocating or expressing rights, sometimes certain people get caught up in the emotions and resort to violence as their only means of, 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 of expressing themselves. And this violence we're talking about is separate and apart from the kind of violence Keenan was talking about when he said, you know, if you gotta get power, you have to take it. This is completely different. I just wanna make that distinction. I'm talking about being emotionally involved in the ability to express <laughs> your right of free speech, association, and all of the rights that are protected under the constitution. You know, sometimes you do it because you're right, but you also can get caught up in the emotions of it, and you might do things that would not you would not ordinarily do if you were just operating in that logical mindset. Of course, human beings, you know, uh, you know, sometimes we choose to operate from a purely logical mindset. Sometimes you don't even entertain the emotions; they just come up upon you, and you have to control them. And sometimes you operate from a purely emotional standpoint because you're trying to convey certain mm -hmm. message or certain uh, relational uh, interactions with, with your other people. So we understand all of these things. Let's keep it, you know, distinct. But I just want to say this, and keep on you coming, is that one thing I think we need to start doing as society, as people who are uh, social justice advocates, because I think many of us I think we don't give enough credit uh, to, to ourselves uh, as people who fight for social justice, despite all the criticisms we might have of social justice issues and the way they are handled and the way they are funneled in through whether it's government reform, we might have all kinds of criticisms, but it should not be forgotten that we are not against social justice issues. We are for it. If we criticize, the methods, the strategies, it is because we are looking for better ways. We are looking to improve the way we advocate, the way we advance these issues, and the way we discuss them, and the way we reach solutions. I just want to make that clear. So in talking about this issue of the moderate lively fishery in Southwest Nova Scotia, what I am saying is I have looked at a lot of the coverage and a lot of what has been said out there and I just want to say this one thing. I believe a majority of the people, the commercial fishermen, if you want to term them that way, uh, who went down there, I've heard from so many different interviews where a lot of these folks express that they support the Mi'kmaq right to a moderate livelihood fishery, they support the Mi'kmaq treaty right, they support the constitution, and all of those things that advance enhance and provide for the Mi'kmaq people to be able to exercise this right. Now, there might be a small group, there might be a, a few other people who, when they attend these uh, rallies or these protests, engage in activities that we all do not condone. Let us ensure that as we discuss these things, we also acknowledge that there are people on this side of the commercial fishermen who have expressly said that they support the treaty rights of our Mi'kmaq people. Let us ensure that we try to bring truth. Let us not just take it as one side versus another and we pick sides. Let us try to be part of facilitating that conversation 
let us be part of making de-escalating de the tension means enabling people to be able to have the conversation without necessarily pinning one person as being, oh, you're on this side and that is all you stand for. You're on this side and that is all you stand for. That is what I want to say about this issue. And I can talk a little bit deeper about it as we go further. But Kenan, please come in. Well, you know, I'm really glad to hear you uh, mention the uh, fact that emotions can lead us into dangerous or potentially dangerous situations and how they aren't always good for us. At times, emotions can be a good thing, but in the times of uh, civil unrest or dealing with frustration of any type, it's usually not a good thing. And as a person who used to protest regularly in D.C., I can't speak to much of what happens in Canada, per se, as I'm not as uh, completely social aware. For those watching, we don't rehearse much of this. We may have talked about many of these things before or during messages and whatnot, but to be on the same page is beautiful. And so I'll say that to be out there protesting when I was younger in, in the past years, I witnessed and learned really fast that once your movement grows, which means that there are more people who are frustrated and want to gain, uh, grow in that movement, once you start getting attention publicly or even on a national level, that's when you get infiltrated. And what I mean by that is you don't have people standing beside you that truly have the same interest at heart, who may say, I'm here to, to protest nonviolently. And even before you get infiltrated, there, are, there is a risk that someone is using that moment because they're so frustrating and have nothing to lose that they may be the one who decides to do something chaotic and crazy in the middle of a what was supposed to be a peaceful protest. Mm -hmm. But once it's been infiltrated by outside parties, from what all means that we don't know who these outside parties are, people will try to say they do, but regardless of who it is, you've now added people who have interests of their own. It could be as simple as somebody who owns a glass fixing company who says that, you know what, I'll send 10 people downtown to break windows that I'm going to repair. And then it may be some type of gun advocacy, like a, or sorry, not a gun rights uh, issue, who sends someone out there just to shoot in the air so they can use it as a calm sort of a means to an end to try to create more gun legislation. They're all kind of things. And what happens is when your emotions are leading you and other people's energy and emotions are around you, you're prone to do something that you wouldn't do in a logical mind, especially when tear gas or rubber bullets start flying at you from the police or a baton. When all of a sudden it becomes dangerous, like Mike Tyson, the uh, boxer, said it best, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and so when you get punched in the mouth, theoretically, whether it be from get tear gas or a bullet or just the panic of people around you when things go wrong, you may not do the best thing. And you may get caught up in the moment of being uh, violent or doing something that you didn't plan on doing in that moment. But I'm glad you once again mentioned that because it's something that, you know, as you grow up, if you have the ability to either see a few bad things in the moments of protest, you grow out of it if you have logic in, in, in the front of your mind. You go, okay, this isn't working. I've seen my ancestors do this. We do the same thing over and over again, and we're expecting different results. And what happens is some people like me will grow out of it, and then some new ones are going to take our place. So it's our job as elders, no matter what our age is, to teach the youth to not do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, and also to not lead with their emotions. We're not playing checkers while they're playing chess. Mm. Mm. Very well said, uh, my friend. Let's 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 elevate the conversation uh, uh, further. So you talked about the illusion of inclusion. I, I I keep going back to this because it's very important to to sort of the theme we're talking about. So I want to set it out for our viewers uh, that. We're talking about categories. Why, why do we choose to talk about categories? Um, you know, I started thinking about all the things that feed into inequality. And it led me to think a little bit far back. And I'm not a philosopher. And I know that there's a lot of people who are very more educated and, and versed in philosophy and, and all of this, the, the, the knowledge around categories, its origins, uh, right from Aristotle and, and Hegel and all of those guys who are trying to figure it out. So what we are saying is that we, we are not saying that we are going to deal away with categories. No, we are never ever going to be able to deal away with categories. Just like I asked the question, 
Uh, is there any end in sight to inequality? I would dare say no as well. We, we, we are never going to able, be able to deal away with inequality. Now, what can we do reasonably, knowing that something as much as categories which we use in our everyday lives, it is so prevalent, could feed into views around views that perpetrate inequality. How do we deal with this issue? Is there a possibility that we can refine the way we think about categories? Is there a possibility that we can reduce the over categorization of human beings, human lived experiences, and all the things that then feed into create inequality in society? That is what I want us to talk about today. We're not talking about eliminating categories, no. We're talking about one, over categorization and how that feeds into inequality, and two, whether there are possibilities where we can refine the way we categorize so that we don't create prejudice. Okay, now that I've said that out, uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's get chatting. So, the first thing I want to raise for us, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have pinned the uh, link to the comment section. So if you feel inspired and want to participate in this conversation, you can join us. Yes, yes, something that I want to use to illustrate what I was talking about. So I went through reading through the origins of categories and, and, and what they were trying to accomplish. And I had some conversations with some people. And generally what I got out of this is that, you know, it's innate in us. That, uh, certainly that's what the, 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 the Aristotle and all those folks who were the earliest philosophers, even modern philosophers like Immanuel Kant, the folks who were trying to understand how we categorize in our brains uh, came to the conclusion that it begins from an innate place. So it is in us to want to sort out things to want to group like things, to want to identify like things. It is in us. But uh, what happened that we grew from that to the point where even when we find distinctions and similarities, we still want to create other distinctions and similarities, even when they will have a negative effect. So that is what I mean by over categorization. Let me give you an example. So. I went reading and I looked at this issue around the human, human beings, okay? And one of the things that I found is that, um, you know, I was looking at, all right, uh, race, for example. How many races are there? And then I started looking at what's the definition of race? Where did that originate from? And then I realized that in a bid to identify our human person, we started to uh, separate and distinct from other living things. We started to classify or categorize. You know, so the human is the top, top, top of the animal ladder, right? So that's us. So then uh, we didn't leave it at that. We started saying, but we are different as human beings. And so we started finding uh, features that could differentiate us or features that made us similar. So we now identified male, female, and we, we, we went through those separations. We identified those purely based on biology, right? So we, we looked at biology to help us distinguish male, female. All right. We didn't stop at that. We went further to say, oh, maybe we should categorize human beings based on where they come from. So we started this idea of nationality or national origin or ethnic origin. So we say they are Africans, they are Asians, they are Europeans, they are Americans, they are people from Oceania, right? So. We didn't end there again. We went further to say, oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's classify, you know, let's, let's break it down. Let's look at the physical futures. So then we start saying, 
oh, what color is this human? So we say, oh, one human is, is black, the other human is white, the other human is red, and the other humans are yellow people, right? So the reason I walk us through this is to see that as we are going further, you start seeing that because we keep trying to categorize and classify the human person, we get to a point where those classifications and categories begin to have a negative impact on our common humanity. What do I mean by this? So we get to a point where the reason somebody can say that white supremacy, white people are supreme, is because first of all, we gave them the term white people. We, we, we called a certain group of people white. And then that caused somebody to start thinking, why are these people distinct and separate, not just by color, but otherwise? And so you have concepts like that coming up. We, 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 we create a distinction where we say, when we talk about the context of inequality in terms of race, we always look at it as binaries. It's white versus black. What about all the people in the middle who are neither white as we term it or black as we term it? So these are all the issues that I think I want us to start unpacking and exploring. And, and I'm not naive. I realize that there is a lot. There is a lot to unpack, to walk through, to discuss, to understand. I don't know it all. Part of this is also my own learning. But I hope that as we start talking about these things, maybe we would start finding ways to refine the way we categorize our experiences, um, the way we look at each other. And perhaps it might call for elimination of certain terminologies that we use in categorizing. We've already done that in the past. We've created new terminologies to accommodate, to be inclusive. So these are all the things that I feel having this sort of conversation would sort of help us on. Kinan, come on in. Whew. Well, all right. Uh, first thing I want to say to that is to inequality. First thing that rung a bell to me is that there's nothing equal in the universe. No cell, no being, no anything. Any of even you have something that say a plastic bottle or a toy. They're not equal. They're made, Everybody there's different. Yes. Yeah, your ears, your eyes, yeah, this the, <laughs> the symmetry of your face. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so because of that, that leads to human beings who, like you said, being at the top of the food chain, having intellect, which separates us from not all but some creatures. Mm. And that intellect at times will create the reason for somebody to believe that they have the right to rule over another or at least tell someone what to do. Like when you're a child in, in elementary school. You see children that are bossy and want to tell people what to do from a very early age. It's innate in us at times, but that's okay because in a society of alphas and betas, you're going to have that. Everyone can't be chief and everyone can't be, you know, part of the uh, the bottom part of the pack. So I say pack because in a natural society where people actually find fairness without equality, you move in a pack which allows you to challenge your authorities and those authorities change. The problem is with intellect, someone realized that a pack would allow them to be taken out. So therefore they created a hive. In a hive, you have a queen who is unquestioned. Therefore, everyone follows the lead of the hive and, and no one presents a reason to challenge it even as new bees are born within that hive. And so because of the hive and pack mentality being so different, a hive is going to use those categories as it means to compartmentalize people where they package just using it as a way to just to categorize and describe, which will create balance, where the other one where a hive will create control. And as you mentioned earlier about the races, the thing I'll add to that is, is that look at American history. <clears throat> people say that, oh, uh, they a bunch of uh, Europeans dragged a bunch of Africans across the most treacherous ocean in the world on boats and brought them to the Americas, which I would like to try to debate that, which I'll do that another day. But 
even with that, the numbers of people who were already here would have outnumbered them. So as you see time progress by the 1920s in World War I in, this, in the erection of the Statue of Liberty, bring me your sick, bring me your weak, bring me your poor, is because there was a numbers game being played here. So therefore, when you get Irish Americans, Italian, Polish people moving into the Americas, they're not right away classified as white, even though they today would be just because of the color of their skin. But as a numbers game, being that Caucasians, not to make this a race thing, but Caucasians make up less than 9% of the world's population. So as a clever way to maintain control in this new hive mentality, come on then Italians and Irish people, you're white now. So therefore we can now dominate this society of brown folks who are already here in the Americas. But what that also does is that the categories have now been flipped and they pack. We gave those categories to ourselves from tribes and so on and so forth. But when it becomes a hive, those categories are now used as a means to create a caste system of oppression. For example, we've been told in America that we were once Negroes, colored, African American, or Black. But that African American is a non descendable term, which gives me no uh, right to claim descendants to a land. And what more clever way than would you do to change the category of a people so that they won't know their true nationality? Because mm. as Malcolm X said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. So we were already here. Mm. No offense to my motherland of Africa, but many of us brown folks traveled over here first. Mm. And, 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 and that, is, that, that has been substantiated. I mean, it, the, before the transatlantic slave trade, it is widely known that uh, travel across continental travel had been happening long, long before Columbus came to America, long, long before the, the uh, folk, folks from continental Europe went on the expeditions to discover the world. I mean, if we want to go back and, and, and look at the historics of this, uh, you would even find that while a lot of, we don't even need to look at this because we, we have a lot of evidence. You know, I, I was, you know, I was reading in preparation for the show, I was reading about, you know, different things, categories, race, and all of these things and trying to make sense of how do we get here? You know, like I said, there, there are categories certainly has value to our way of life as human beings and our societies, the way we build them. We are not here saying that do away with categories because they are useless. No, but what we are saying is in a bit to make our life a little easier uh, in categorizing, we then went overboard and began to over categorize so much so that it is now having a negative effect in terms of the way we view each other, the way we live our lives and, and, and perpetuating inequality which we have also acknowledged is always going to be present but we as humans can do more to reduce the presence of inequality but by this over categorization we are invariably accentuating inequality and making it a much more predominant thing in our livelihood but i digress let me go back to what i was talking about so i was trying to underpin your point which in my readings, um, you know, they said uh, the, the very first human beings, the very first homo sapien, you know, uh, was in Africa. And at the time, no matter continental uh, shelves were not the way they are now where we have clearly defined, this is Europe, that is America, this is South America and all of these things. It was pretty much a, a giant landmass, you know, and to an extent, in my readings, it even said that this first Homo sapien had darker skin, a darker skin color. And as people began to move across the landmass and territories, and as the uh, environment did its thing, and landmasses began to separate, and people were able to move further north because of whether it's temperate. There was even some discussion about whether uh, it was a cancer that led to uh, people becoming more light skin or whether it was the environment yes polar bears polar bears polar bears <laughs> right so 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 again right so 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 this are uh, this this all happened and and there was an evolution of this but the point we're trying to make is that 
you know, the, the, the whole notion, the whole social construct of race did not take into account all of these things. You know, God bless the people who, you know, the academics who, who, who try to, you know, I, I think they were probably doing their best trying to say, let's, let's define these things and uh, for whatever purposes, but it, it brought us to a point where we are today where it seems that after all of these years, perhaps we need to revisit some of what these ancient philosophers or those folks we call modern philosophers, the, the people who came up with some of these concepts that are very front and center of our everyday living. We need to revisit some of these things and see whether they continue to be a force for positive good or whether they have since lost their value in terms of what they were trying to promote and are now more so a force for negative good. So I, I think that's, that's sort of what uh, uh, we want to talk about because if, if you just look at this brief history of what I've laid out, then there's no difference between a dark skinned person and a light skinned person because we all came from the same place, right? So then why is it that we have to now say, oh, this person is of this race and this person is of this race when we know inherently we all came from the same place? Yes, environment may have changed our skin complexion, but it didn't change our biology. It didn't change the, the fact that we are connected and we come from the same family, right, of beings. So those are some of the things that I think, uh, you know, we're gonna be exploring during this series. And um, we would love for any of our viewers who wants to participate, who has something to say about it, to come on, join the conversation in the comment section or come on and, and, and share your views. This is certainly not something that uh, we are going to be the authorities on, but uh, as you know, this platform certainly is there to create space for frank, honest conversations that can advance us all. You know, whether we learn from it, it could be me learning from it, it could be you learning from it, but as long as we are edified and we see a higher purpose to our connections as being, I think that is a plus. So uh, here's another thing that I wanna point out in terms of this issue of categories and inequality. And I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts. So I was having this conversation with my wife uh, in preparing for this and, and one of the things that I, that, that, that came up was poverty, right? So we're talking about inequality. We, we have the poverty line, which was, you know, it was some kind of a creation. Somebody came up with it and said, hey, let's find a way to measure poverty and then be able to say, here are people who are poor and need more help. And here are people who, they may not be the richest, but they are, they are okay. They might do just fine. So we came up with a poverty line, right, to, to affect that measure. But then what happened? You know, once we have the poverty line and we say that X number of people fall below the poverty line, rather than focusing policy to see what we can do to alleviate that situation, what do we do? We create a distinction between those who are well-to-do by saying some of you are middle class, some of you are, uh, you know, and beyond the middle class, wherever you fall. And then we have politicians now who say, oh, all I do is I'm fighting for the middle class, you know? Yeah. And, then, and then we've forgotten that the whole point of having the poverty line was because we wanted to identify people who were poor amongst us and try to alleviate that condition. So again, to me, that was one of the very real consequences of this over categorization. What are your thoughts on that? I think that most people operate in the mindset that society actually works for the people and that these categories are truly something that we have any part of. As uh, we mentioned earlier about um, South Africa mm -hmm. and the shift of power there 
no one who swoops into a nation once again and takes it by force will just willingly want to give it back. So here, for example, in, in, uh, in America, if there's a ruling class that just happens to use white skin as a measure of we're the group who recently took over, therefore anyone who shares the same fairness, whether it be Italians or whether it be Irish people, you're still white because you're going to help us keep this going. And so you have an issue where an economy only works as long as the people find value in the, the, the currency that they use and the things that they buy and the goods that they receive. And so if things get to a point where there are more people who are uh, sucking from the system versus actually contributing, then it becomes a point where there is instability within that economy. So I make that point to where um, the American power that we're living under is fragile. And so in order to keep their power, which happens to be a majority of white men, they have to make sure they keep that group of those big, strong black men at the bottom, the people of color, I should say, because they also have to worry about those, like you said earlier, those yellow people mm -hmm. who want to take and assume power, who are buying our businesses and buying our land. So now they're stuck in the sandwich of people who want to rise up and people who want to take over. And that's a constant Flip. And so it's not that I don't find solutions or believe that there's change in these categorizations that may have gone too far. It's just that for my view of things, I believe that they're just, they're used as a means for control, as a way of saying, we have to keep this people here. And if we mix in with them, then we won't have this easy way of control because they automatically know that, as you say earlier, people were dark. You take most of the people on this planet, you put them in the sun for a few hours, they get darker. You take an Italian person, they could be just as dark as you and I. And if we know history, every continent had brown people on them. It's only after empires pushed people out and made them go to refugees in different places. Like, look at the Egyptians. They moved to the Sudan. But those people are the ones you see the hieroglyphs of, and you see the mummies in the tombs and so on and so forth. But I make that point to say that People, once again, believe that the system works for them and that these changes can be made internally from voting or from doing things that you voice and speak your opinion or that the powers care to make these changes for you. But once again, they categorize you for a reason as a means to keep you in your place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. That, 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 that is absolutely right. And, and I think uh, to follow up on that point, uh, you know, it's interesting that when you start to when you start to look at this, there's so many, there's so many roads that, that you can go down, right? Because yeah. there's just so many things that are attached, like you've touched on power, power structures, and how even that in itself, we can't separate it from just talk about categorization. You know, I believe that the academics, the, the, I'll call them academics, the academic philosophers who were, you know, knocking their heads trying to come about this, certainly when we're thinking about maybe power, but they weren't probably thinking about it in the way that the power systems that we know um, would use this, uh, um, would use this, this features or this or categorization uh, to, to, to will control, you know, to, to, to divide so that they can will control. Maybe they were doing it for an academic purpose. A politician may be doing it for, for political purposes. Some other person may be using the same concepts and doing it for their own private interest, uh, or business, economic interest purposes, and whatsoever. So, how how do we how do we move forward? Understanding that, understanding that you know there are so many things that intersect in the way our world operates, and sometimes when we try to unpack these things, we might just get frustrated because you see a lot of the intersection, and then you're just like, this might be a, you know. A, a, a venture that might not be worth the while, but I think it's important that we engage in it because that's the only way we know. And then when we have conversations with each other, we are not scapegoating each other for things that we shouldn't scapegoat them about. That because at the end of the day, it's the people. The people suffer because the people fight with each other to access, to access power structures, economic benefits, um, you know, social benefits, Whatsoever that it is that we need to access as the people, we will fight each other to have that access. So, so how do we engage in these conversations and understand these different things so that we, the people, can be less combative with each other and understand that uh, our survival as people depends largely on us working with each other. Each other's survival 
um, enhances our own survival as a collective? At this point, it's coming. And uh, we will work better together when we're all feeling the same pressures. You know, I actually was uh, started to smile when you said, how can we fix these things? Because usually my solutions are just in-game solutions. Like, well, eventually this is what's going to happen. <laughs> but until that day comes, what I say is that the best solution that we can have for, to create better dialogue and actually create some change for positivity, which will still bring on that end game, <laughs> is to educate yourself. Knowledge is truly power. And I don't mean necessarily by going to public universities or by reading certain westernized civilization books, but by thoroughly questioning these categories, these labels. We have, for one, we have uh, eugenics. Many people are familiar with eugenics, some are not. But we use terms from that to this day, calling people imbeciles and stupid and things of that nature, or idiots. And those were terms that they created to create a tier of people and also to downsize people so they wouldn't be able to make it in society the same way that in the caste system in India, if you were an untouchable, then you can't even work outside of that class of being an untouchable. And so, for example, by understanding the language, understanding the symbols, and understanding the, the categorizations that you're given, you may understand why they were given to you. And, a, and I'm not necessarily giving you a, a category, but a word that always rings a bell to me in studies of etymology and words, because every word has a root language that it came from. Mm. And so the word that we hear quite often these days is apocalypse. And when people hear that, the first thing they think of is end of the world, gloom and doom, destruction. But in Old English, by way of Old French, the word apocalypse actually meant to uncover and reveal. Apo means to uncover or lift. And then calyptin would be the veil. So to uncover that veil, you get the revealed truth. And we are living in the apocalypse where the truth is revealing itself. And the more people get to understand the truth of the categorizations and realize that these categories that have gone too far are being used as a term and means of oppression then people will react and do something with that mm -hmm. one day. <clears throat> Very well said. I, I want to uh, read something that uh, Hegel, who's one of the uh, key philosophers on categories, he tried to uh, um, explain Kant's categorization. And again, I, I'm not a philosopher, uh, but I, I like to read. And uh, my understanding of it might be flawed, but bear with me, viewers. Uh, we are all in a learning process. And as we learn these things, we engage in conversations, we edify each other, and, and we make progress in that way. So uh, Hegel, uh, so um, in, in, in deducing from Kant's uh, classic uh, list of categories, uh, so he says uh, he, he, he attempted to provide a more comprehensive system of categories than Kant and developed a structure that was almost entirely tribal. So important were categories to Hegel that he claimed the first principle of the world, the absolute, is a system of categories. The categories must be reason of which the world is a consequence. So, I mean, that, that, <laughs> that blew my mind <laughs> because I was thinking through everything and I said, yes, this very revered philosopher who said that, you know, categories must be the reason of which the world is a consequence. So that, that again, going back to saying it is innate in us to think that way. In fact, I was having a conversation with my wife again on this same issue. And, and you know, it is innate in us. But again, isn't it time? Do we as society knowing that we have taken certain pockets of knowledge and the providers of that knowledge and held them as our life, as our standard. Should we be revisiting this in a broader conversation out and aside from people going into an academic institution like a university, studying this guy and writing an academic dissertation, you know, about, you know, what these people had read so that we then take that knowledge and we try to implement it. Should we be having more broader conversations around some of these foundational concepts that have guided our human, um, our humanity from time immemorial? I mean, we're going back to you know, the 18th century. We still have concepts from the, from the middle centuries 
that we rely on uh, uh, in many ways. So is, is that something that you think about? Well, I mean, we've gotten to the point where things have stretched because the cultures have stretched, so therefore more categories have been found. And there are so many things to distract the people in the mind that it's hard to even realize why you could be being fooled, why things are moving the way that they're moving. Most people are just paying their bills and trying to get through life, you know, and, and it's crazy, but ultimately I feel like, you know, people will eventually see through the veil, but it's going to take time because many of us are slaves to the grind or of the matrix of the consume, buy, sleep, obey type situation. But um, you can't keep a sleeping giant down forever. People have people die every day. People are born every day, mm -hmm. and um, and because of the wealth uh, gap growing the way that it is, that creates more oppression, which puts more people in the same line of thought than when there's a middle, lower class, and so on and so forth. But when there's many more people on what we can now consider the lower class, then you start finding commonalities. People start getting along. People start to realize who their true enemy is. And then you try to break down those categories that hold you down. But at the core, like you said, at the very least, we're already three parts. We're mind, we're body, and we're our soul. And that mind is the, can do it, the connector between the two. And we see that difference in many of us, whether no matter what religion we believe in. And because of that duality that we have of us having this fleshly experience and then the other half of us having the eternal experience in the spirit world, it's always going to be that. It's just a matter of people coming together and realizing that we're all in this together. Like you said, you know, we're all the same. We came from the same source, but someone decided to use it for their own means to keep and maintain power. Because what happens is that to take it to another level is that some people, this is all they have in this world is all they have. Many of us have a spiritual understanding. Like I'll say this, I said this to my father, he didn't quite understand me. Not every human being is human. And he looked at me like, huh? I said, well, go into a, a Whole Foods or a grocery store of your, of your type and look at the tomato aisle or watermelon aisle and you'll see organic, you'll see seedless. And so that watermelon who has no seeds knows that it can't reproduce. Therefore, it will no longer be here once it's gone. Hmm. It has nothing to carry on, no legacy. That watermelon with seeds knows that when it's consumed and enjoyed, its seeds will grow on and grow more watermelon. And there's another life of people who have those seeds, which I also call a soul, not to go too far. But that really breaks down our society because there's two different types of people. Hmm. Not by race, per se, but by adaptation and other means. So, so just based on your last point, sh should we is it time to start revisiting some of this? Uh, I don't want to, like we said, we're not eliminating categories, but certainly we've seen over the course of our lifetimes uh, where, you know, because of advocacy for social justice uh, against inequality, um, things have been altered to, 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 to accommodate, you know, or, or the, the greater good. For example, um, we talk about, uh, you know, the use of, gender binary terms, right? Over the course of our lifetime, we've seen that go from gender binary terms to now we have, you know, all, you know, you, you can express yourself in, in all these different ways, uh, uh, your, your gender and your being, right? But that's certainly a conscious, deliberate, intentional, um, after a lot of fight and advocacy uh, uh, that, that all of that happened. So, why is it that we continue to leave um, some of the categories that carry a lot more negative connotation in the way we see and express ourselves to linger? Uh, is it time to start uh, revisiting those? Well, the, uh, the problem is, is that when it comes to these uh, categories and this growing categories lingering is because of the fact that now we live in a, uh, what I want to say, what it, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, a politically correct society. So therefore, right. once these categories grow and you choose a side, especially in this country, as you consider to be a liberal, you can't speak against those new categories, those groups, otherwise you're cast out. I mean, uh, so it's something that I don't think will go away for a while until people really catch on to the fact that there's the, there's the vision through these categories. But I'll also say this, and are you bilingual, correct? Yes. 
So I say that one of the things that really holds us back in this world and one of the systems that is aided to this categorization to be used as oppression is the increase of the English language as a means of communication. And I say that because we are speaking and thinking, more importantly, in a bastardized tongue. And I say that because of the fact that it's a combination of a couple of different languages. Mm. And it's also very inefficient due to the fact that it's a, our language, you talk about adding A through Z together to make uh, words and taking those words to make sentences and sentences to make uh, paragraphs. It's a long process, whereas other ancient or older languages that had efficient ways of communicating through symbols and letters and characters that you didn't have to take so much time to compute in your own head or teach your children, you could further advance the thought and the process of growing out of the things that people use to oppress you when you can think faster than you have to compute it all. It's like, this is a really hard <laughs> way of thought. If you under, And I think you understand why people would have to have a hard time learning English. Right, right. And, and, and that's a very, very interesting point, uh, because certainly you, you've had, you know, or, or, you know, sometimes you, you hear that uh, certain expressions uh, are, are easier and, and more efficiently expressed in another language, uh, contrary to the way they are expressed in English. Certainly, you know, uh, you've heard that about French. And then you talk about, you know, the old uh, ways of writing or, or, or of communicating. Uh, using symbols, you know, certainly there's no, there's usually no ambiguity in, in, in that kind of communication, while our communication carries a lot of ambiguity. And, you know, contrary to categories may have been a way to sort of help facilitate that communication. But as we are saying, uh, because society has expanded over time, as societies have modernized, uh, uh, we are now over categorizing and, and to a point where it's having a net negative effect, if I may say that. But I wanted to uh, uh, have us have a conversation about this just before we wrap up. I realize uh, we are at the top of the hour and thank you for everyone who's uh, watching uh, and has joined us today. So how do we, because you talked about something, perhaps a uh, hundred years from now, I'm no longer going to be around. You're not going to be around. Maybe uh, uh, the entirety of the population that's here now might not be around. Uh, if you know, say 100 years from now, except a few people, uh, you know, a, 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 it's a baby. smaller segment, the babies. <laughs> but how, how is, what, what, what can we do in terms of the way categorization is being used nowadays that can help this generation that are going to be alive a hundred years from now to be better, not, not just better in the visual sense, aesthetic, aesthetic sense, but better in how they fight some of the ills that we are fighting today, like inequality, right? Because I imagine if a hundred years from now, people are still able to say, and I'm just using this as an example, uh, people are still able to say, oh, that's a black person, that's a white person, that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, just, just to use a loose category, then we, we still have the same, we still have the same root thought process of distinguishing one human being from another. Um, certainly, the color is not the most dynamic distinction between us as human beings. So if we're not doing anything today to ensure that people know that, yes, for over 100 years, we've been using color as a major way to distinguish ourselves. But hey, you know what? Right now, we've come to an understanding that that isn't the most dynamic distinction. We can distinguish ourselves as human beings without necessarily invoking color because we recognize that when we invoke color, it also invokes other on warranted consequences that we didn't think about in the way people think through other issues that are consequent for people being uh, unequal or promoting inequality? Well, I think there are two things that have to happen. Um, one is going to have to be the loss of ego, because one of the things I've heard some of our, my uh, quote unquote white allies is that white is an attitude, not my color or my race same as if they wouldn't necessarily be European when their actual term of categorization is Caucasian. 
Mm. So it's a choice that some people choose to go with these uh, categories because they want to belong to a group or their ego around it, that category or that title, they want to keep it. But the other part that's going to have to happen to create that change of these categories is people choose and are taught to go to the source of all things that we categorize. So instead of saying that I'm a white or a black man or I'm so on and so forth, really like, for example, now you have people realizing that they're not Spanish because of the language that they speak. So they don't like being called Spanish, but then at the same time, because of the conquistadors, you're still calling yourself Latin. And now the new term that I hear many people in the Latin community is calling themselves Latin X. So they're choosing to keep on stepping up the level in these categories. But if they really went back to the source, and that's also a part of the oppression in our language and our history is that many of these sources have been taken from us so instead of calling, if I were, and I'm speaking for another race, but I've had this conversation with many, and I'll say the same about myself momentarily, is that I would consider myself to be what I know for many of them to be a Taino Indian, or a Taino, you know, will be the tribe. Mm -hmm. So for example, being a person who understands that my people are indigenous to the Americas or Turtle Island, I would consider myself to be Native American or indigenous or, or you know, my tribe, which would be Pamunkey. But those are still categories. But if I break it down to that, yeah, it may create a broader sense of uh, categorization. But what it will do, it won't create, in my humble opinion, tension between those categories because all you're doing is going back to the root of what you really truly are from the very first categorizations that made sense but weren't given to you as a means of oppression. Right. So we can get back to calling ourselves what was called what we called ourselves. Like, I, do you would you really consider yourself to be? African, if you were born in Africa because of the many countries that are there and the fact that that name Africa wasn't even the original name? Mm. No, you're right. And, and that's, that's, that, that's, why, that's partly why I raised that question uh, because I was looking at us returning to some of the root, roots of how these categories even came about because the reason they were trying to categorize was because they were trying to create, they were trying to describe as distinct from others, one thing. And so if we find that the best way to describe and show that there is a distinction is not necessarily using a categorization that creates further problems for the group or creates strife amongst a uh, 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 human community, then we can use you know, what just identifies us. Like, you know, we, we identified ourselves from the beginning as humans, homo sapiens, that was it. We were human beings. And then, you know, we started saying, oh, well, you know, let's distinguish you who comes from the North from you who comes from the South. And then that starts creating the problem. So I totally agree. We should go back to the root. And perhaps that will be very instructive and informative as to how we can use more positive categorizations. Imagine moving to America and English being your second language and somebody tell you to go drive on the parkway and park in your driveway. If you can't fix things like that, right. <laughs> it's gonna be a way. <laughs> and and, you, nailed, and you, you, you nailed it because you talked about those attitudes. You know, you said if, somebody has, if somebody's ego is tied to a certain categorization, then they may not wanna give it up. And, that goes to what you also said in the post earlier about the truth. Right. When it comes to the truth, people that choose to accept a lie because they love that lie are not going to gain or see the real truth in a lot of cases. And, they don't want to. Yeah, absolutely right. And if we don't have a chance to have conversations where we, we can acknowledge that something is, is the truth, but that we've deviated from it, and, and, and are deviating from that for reasons that have been advanced. That's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, just because you acknowledge that this is the truth, uh, you know, doesn't mean that you are necessarily always bound to that. You could have a, a logical, perfectly acceptable reason for why you have made a deviation. But if we don't even have the conversations as to what was the truth before we made a deviation, and we are only having our conversation starting from the deviation, then, then, then we create this environment where, you know, people can say, you know, something is an objective truth, uh, something, 
something is an alternative fact, or you know, or, or we, we have all these different variations when we could simply say, this is the truth, this is where we started, but here's the reason why I maybe went this way, or here's the reason why things progressed this way. And then people can say, okay, I understand. Um, how do we solve an issue that is arising, right? So that is also key to this conversation that, that we are having. And it permeates everything we have. So I'll say one last thing that, that, that I saw. And this goes to what we're talking about, the truth. So back again to this uh, crisis in Nova Scotia about the uh, uh, indigenous people exercising their treaty inherent rights to a moderate livelihood fishery, okay? So when you read some of the co uh, comments that people make online, I read one today where somebody was just basically saying, hey, um, and this is somebody who is very learned, I, because I know. Um, and they say, oh, uh, by the way, uh, I condemn the atrocities that are going on. And then they proceed to say that uh, this is being perpetrated by white, uh, they say white fishermen, OK? Now, it, they immediately read that, you know, it, it, it it invokes something within you. But but I, I dare to say that that's not true. That's not accurate. It's, it's not just that these guys, the, you know, the qualifier white fisherman makes it seem as if there's something else happening. But these are commercial fishermen and some of these commercial fishermen are black. Some of them have other colors. Uh, some of them have other ancestries, you know. So, but when you, talk about this issue and you qualify them as white, then you're invoking something more that might not necessarily be true for all of the people who are there expressing this view or the other view. So that again to me is where we have to be really careful when you know we talk about these issues. Let's establish the truth. Let's just establish what is the truth and then we work from there. Establish the truth and also understand that through uh, division, you can be conquered. So really definitely look into those things and understand how you can be divided. Absolutely. Uh, Kinan, it's always great uh, having conversations Indeed. with you. Thank you to all of our viewers uh, who have joined us this afternoon. Um, as you know, this is episode one of this series, talking about categories, um, race, and its impact on inequality. Um, we have done our best uh, because this is a very broad uh, topic with a lot of rabbit holes and a lot of different paths that conversations can take. But certainly as we go down the series, we're going to try to focus on specific issues so that uh, we can have some real substantive conversations. Not to say that what we had today wasn't substantive, it was very well substantive. But that was in a bit to set the stage so that you see all the different angles, you see how difficult these issues are, and you see how expansive this kind of conversation can go or, or it can reach because of what we're talking about. So thank you all for joining. We appreciate your support. Um, join us uh, next weekend. We would have a very um, spirited guest uh, on the show. Our co-host Wes would also be here and we would have more uh, from uh, Keenan on what is happening in, in, in his backyard down there in the US. And we will also have uh, some uh, community uh, guests participating from uh, the international arena uh, on something that we are working on and we will inform you about it next week. That is going to be exciting. Uh, we're looking for ways to make this show better, to make this platform more inclusive and, and, and uh, achieving what we, we set out to achieve. So thank you all for joining. Have a lovely Sunday evening. And uh, Kinan, I don't know if the, uh, uh, what, what's the name now of the, of, what's the new name of the uh, NFL team down there in DC? <laughs> What name? The Washington football team, man. The Washington, <laughs> the Washington, Washington football team. That's the no name. <laughs> and that's uh, Daniel Snyder being the jerk right there since he was forced out of his name. Well, we're not going to even have a title. We'll just be the football team. <laughs> that works. That yeah, works. for now. Yeah, it works for now. So, for now. So, um, 
you know, I know you said you're from Virginia, but you're-, you're, you're I'm from I D.C., but I live in Virginia, which is, you know, I'm like 10 minutes outside of the city. Right. I'm from D.C., work in D.C., but I live in Virginia, and I clarified that in case anybody uh, sees me in, my, in the videos previously with my firearms. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. Well, good luck to uh, the Washington football team. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. They need and, it. Trust me. <laughs> thank you so much and uh lovely to have this conversation and uh we will be telling you when uh episode two of this series airs or comes on air and uh we will be glad if you can join us on it thank you again thank you for having me all right uh ladies and gentlemen that is uh it for us um have a lovely sunday I'm your host here, Chet McFarlane. Welcome to Unfiltered. I'm your host here, Chet McFarlane. Welcome to Unfiltered.